Good. So joining us on the Celebrity Couch today, we have... Kent George Lambert. Full name. I know. Middle name and everything. Uh, you're not related to uh, Mr. Lambert the singer, are you? No, like Adam. Yeah. No. No? No? Like, nor Christopher Lambert the actor. Oh, yes. Of um, Highlander fame. Neither. Although, to be fair, he actually prefers his name to be said in the French. Christophe Lambert. Kent, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, I own a beard company. I make um, men's grooming products, uh, handmade, organic, natural men's grooming products. Um, graduated Toy for Cardi in 2002. Um, always wanted to be an actor. Um, have worked on a number of films and a number of short films and stuff uh, over the years. Um, at 42, I sort of uh, am not sure, but I have the, the passion, the get up, the drive, the gumption. Um, I certainly don't that I did when I was 21. So, I, I mean, I don't know. Um, it's an interesting field. It's always been an interesting field. Um, my father told me that he'd pay for a, uh, pay for my, university off I went and I did a law degree so I went and did first year law and I found it incredibly boring so I, I jacked it in and went and did um philosophy and English literature instead which is a lot more fun um but I didn't have my old man pay for it which is a bummer racked up a pretty awesome student loan um and then I went to drama school so the idea was to get the idea that dad says get something behind you first get something behind you first um so the, the law school was just to do something so that I could actually go to drama school. I ended up just going to drama school, um, and it was fun. It was fine. Um, <coughs> and then I came out of that um, and, you know, tried to be an actor for nine years or so, just doing that, like, you know, waiting tables and working on hospitality and, um, I don't know, various different things. Um but nothing sort of career-wise. And then uh, after about nine years of that and realising that I was, you know, into my 30s and sort of going nowhere um, with, you know, buying a house or, or getting any financial security, I went back to school and did a um, Bachelor of Counselling and became a uh, counsellor and did that for nine years, couples counselling and men with violence and alcohol issues and... and uh, and young men with anger issues, um, and couples. Uh, that was, and so that was about nine years of that. And then I, um, I fell into the the beard oil thing. Really, just just sort of happened. Just sort of. Tell us about that, that big luscious beard of yours. Why did you grow it? Why have you kept it? Why did I grow? I used to be a seasonal beard grower. In that, um. I'd grow my beard over winter and then shave it off over summer. Grow it over winter, shave it off over summer. Um, then my dad died, which is a weird intro, but you know that's the story, really. Dad died. Um, it was unexpected. It was expected that he was going to die, but not so quickly. He had stage four lung cancer, and he had had a pneumoectomy removal of uh one of your lungs a year before um and then the cancer as it so often does came came back and it was more virulent than it was beforehand um so they gave him six months uh from that point and he died within six weeks and um and so i wasn't really prepared for it. i was doing a a uh, solo stand-up show um at kitty o'shea's and um it was going really well, um, you know, um, I got good reviews and everything went well and the idea was to finish that up and then go over and spend a couple of months with Dad while he still had a couple of months left. And then the night that I finished the show, um, the next morning my sister called and said, look, if you're going to um, come over and see Dad, you got to do it in like now because he's in the hospital and... You know, he might not make it. So I got the next um, 
I got the next plane ticket to Brisbane, which is where they were living at that time. And, um, like, genuinely, the next one, this was, like, 8 o'clock in the morning, and the next ticket to Brisbane was 10.30 that morning, so I got the next one, packed my bags, um, got to the airport, and he died when I was in the waiting room in Wellington Airport, so I didn't even get onto the plane to get to Brisbane. So I got to Brisbane, um, pretty sort of devastated, really, because, you know, didn't get to say buy and get to do the things that I expected to be able to do. Um, went into the morgue where he was laid out and just wailed on him, beat the shit out of him. I was really angry. Which is weird, you know, your the corpse of your father laying there and I was just yelling at him and screaming at him and just, you know, why? And I was really upset about it. It was quite, quite horrific. Um, and for about sort of the the few weeks or so or month before that he'd be talking about doing his last will and testament and it will, I do accept that it was something he wanted to um, finish but he just never did he didn't get his affairs in order so no one had done that um, so I decided to stay around in, uh, in Brisbane and do that become um, so I went and studied all the um, you know, law around what you had to do with a, you know, a state and what you had to do with, um, like, a corpse. <laughs> and, you know, because none of that was paid for and none of that was done and I wanted to get it done the cheapest possible way. And, you know, you go to a um, an undertaker, a funeral director, and the cheapest thing they have is, like, you know, five and a half, six grand. I'm like, that's it big chunk of money man um but i found out if you don't buy an urn and if you don't have them have a service for you and if you don't want the body embalmed and if you don't want a fancy casket and if you can just put them in a um cardboard sleeve and get them cremated and um you know get the get the ashes brought out in a, in a cardboard box and then I did the master of ceremonies and everything for the um, funeral um, you can do the whole thing for about 600 bucks so done 600 bucks um, <coughs> ran the um, the funeral once over in Brisbane and then once back here in uh, New Zealand and Marston where he grew up so that we could do that and the whole thing I think cost about 1500 bucks or something all up and um, and while I was over there in, in Brisbane um, you know sorting all this shit out my beard grew longer and one of the um, things with grief is that you tend to hold on to stuff even as I found out um, facial hair so you just don't shave when you're in like the throes of grief um quite commonly so i didn't hot humid climate getting really itchy being dandruffy so i um i looked up online how to get rid of beard dandruff and they said use beard oil i'm like well, where do i get beard oil now we're in new zealand now we're in australia um so i bought some from the states and it cost about, um, I don't know, 65, 68 New Zealand dollars to get it into New Zealand. And it worked good, but then I realised after three months when it was all gone, I uh, that I have to go and do that again, and that was a bit much money, really, 68 bucks. So I, I thought oh, I'd make my own. Oh, I thought I could make it for much cheaper than that. Turned out I couldn't. The first three bottles of beer oil that I made cost me about 80 bucks a bottle. But that was because I was buying, like, tiny bits of this much in fact the first time i bought vitamin e oil i bought it in capsules and then poked um the capsules with a pin and then dripped that out into the bottles um little bits of argan oil little bits of a hobo or little bits of almond oil and now i know my secret that's all the things that go into it plus essential oils you can make it yourself um, <coughs> 
and um you know it's expensive um but uh after i started making it more often and i had a few friends that said look it was you know it's really good shit um after i made it for them they were like oh cool and i thought well if my friends like it and i like it maybe there's a market for it and so i took it to the uh wellington nine market and um start selling for 20 bucks a bottle and i thought well if i can you know sell five or six of them i can uh make myself beer money for the week and i took 20 bottles to that first night market and sold 19 of them i said it's pretty good that's pretty good you know 180 bucks minus the 30 or 40 bucks it cost me to buy the ingredients of it well you know um that's quite a lot of beer for the week um and that's how it happened that's that's how i grew the beer and um started the company really i also see that you work as a tour guide so what's a typical day in that kind of field um crack a few jokes talk about acting talk a bit about myself um talk a bit about wellington and the the movie um culture in wellington i i mean i um I again it was just it's a summer job and when you're an actor and you often work um other jobs and I don't really need the money at all. Um but it's a way of me getting out of the um the office and getting away from, you know, buying and selling beard oil and doing something a little bit more um fun, you know and so i do it i i do it and it doesn't pay enormously but um on a day where you get a lot of tips and i get a lot of tips i probably make more in tips than i do on the you know for wages for the day so that makes it worthwhile again it's beer money again and um yeah just just a little bit of extra spare spending money talking about lord of the rings i happen to be in um all six of the Middle Earth movies that have been made in New Zealand. So I played an Urukai in the in the first three Lord of the Rings movies, um, and that was fun. I'm um, working on the Battle of Helm's Deep and uh, uh, the Battle for the Fields of Pelennor as well. Um, and then I uh, played um, the wide shot body double for Bomber in all of the. Uh, the Hobbit movies as well. I'm sure that was equally interesting and fun. Working on a on a big um, production like that's very different to most things you do. Um, you get paid mostly for sitting around and drinking coffee, which is fine. There's a guy actually on the set when you work with Peter Jackson who gets paid to make sure that Peter Jackson's always got a hot cup of coffee. That's his job. His whole job is walking around with a cup of coffee. He, and he dresses immaculately. I don't even know the guy's name. Dresses immaculately, three-piece suit, like vest and everything. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, 30 degrees or, or 8 degrees or whatever. He's just fucking to the nines. And he's got a cup of coffee. And he walks around behind Peter. And when Peter wants a cup of coffee or a drink of coffee, he reaches, all he has to do is reach that far, grabs his coffee of this guy, and then puts it back. And periodically, his, so his job is to make sure that, that coffee's hot all the time and it's there. And so periodically, once it gets cold, he's got a runner who runs, makes the coffee, and brings it back to him. And he communicates with him, I don't know, through ESP or something, because I never saw him pick up the phone or whatever. But every now and again, with a new coffee, yeah, got a coffee. Well, yeah, it's a interesting fucking job. I don't know if it's the same guy doing that all the time or whether that just you just get to be Peter Jackson's coffee bitch on, a, on one movie and then it, and then it's replaced by somebody else. I don't know. Um, the only time I spent um a, a lot of time with Peter was on um was on that uh movie really and and not an enormous amount of time. The most um, most of the directing was being done um by for us was being done by andy circus um, because he was second ad on uh, on the hobbit and um we were working second unit most of the time 
And so we were um, taking direction from Gollum, which was pretty cool. So did you have to do that uh, the favourite um, scene that everybody loves where they have to run away from the wild? Yeah. Yeah? How many days? And tell us about that experience, because I know um, a lot of the actors have said that they didn't like it because it was quite demanding. Yeah, if you talk to other, like, body doubles that were doing it or something. Uh, well, the actors have always mentioned it, like Armageddon and stuff, you know. So right, yeah. Scene 66 was the worst. Yeah, scene 66. <laughs> Scene 66. So scene 66 you won't see in the movie, right? It's just, it's just like actors running away from shit. That's all it is. So scene 66 is just actors. So you, you, actors running away from wags, that's scene 66. Actors running away from goblins, that's scene 66. Actors running away from orcs, scene 66. It's all the same. It's just scene 66. Just running across different backgrounds um being chased by people you can't see because they're not there obviously you, you, the point is just to run yeah it's it's bizarre and um we did the major it's funny that the the, the main actors get to complain about that because we did the most the the extras did most of it like 40 days or something just running um running through creeks and running over you know, mountains and running through snow and running. I mean, it was cool. We got picked up in a helicopter in the morning and got flying over some of the most beautiful snow capped mountains and beautiful verdant valleys with like crystal clear blue lakes. You know, fly up, get landed on the side of a mountain, and everyone gets out. I'm in this massive fat suit, um, like 35 kgs, like 70 pounds worth of fat suit every day. And you couldn't piss him. You couldn't couldn't do anything in it. And get to the side of the mountain, um, and the sun's shining, birds are singing, it's beautiful, it's stunning, absolutely gorgeous. Some of the most beautiful scenery in New Zealand, which, you know, for my mind, is some of the most beautiful scenery in the world. And you get there and there's early in the morning and it's crisp it's like 6 30 or something and just one of those perfect sparkling days and it's what are we doing today i'll send 66 shit this is rubbish this is absolute shit run around this beautiful scenery all day um but you know it's a oh god it was it was fine it was fine. You get, you get fed really well when you're on the set of a major motion picture. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you think running around after like 10 days or 20 days, you'd lose a, like a bunch of weight. Um, I, I think the first 20 days I was on set, um, I, I like put on two kgs just because of the food all the just constant food like it's food and you, you get like massive bus buffet breakfasts and lunches and dinners and then you get like they keep bringing you food when you're on set oh would you like a banana or something oh yeah okay banana. sure cookie oh yeah i like cookie yeah yeah and they just keep because it's you know multi millions of dollars 300 million dollars you have to spend it's got to go somewhere <coughs> yes, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, you, uh, that yeah, when you have to spend three hundred million dollars, it's got to go somewhere, and the the unit and the catering is a big part of that, you know. And I, uh, I thought that was a pretty good idea. So I suppose along with Damien, and along with Des, if you want to see a second part of this interview with Kent talking about, you know, the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit and all the other experiences and King Kong with Jack Black. Then hashtag second interview with Kent. Um, so there's just one last thing I want to ask about The Hobbit. Because um, I'm a big fan. I do the Lord of the Rings tours as well now. I've just recently got into it. Yes. Did you do the barrel ride? Yeah, yeah we did. Um, so we did it, um, but we didn't do it in the the main thing in um, the top of the South Island. We came back and we did it and we shot it in the studio. So in like a big submerged tank um, in Studio K, back in the uh, in the lot, um, which is they can f it's a big tank they can fill the whole thing up, 
Um, and you would have thought, well, if they can fill the whole thing up, they'll do it with like lukewarm water or, you know, but it's fucking freezing. Like cold water. And you're like, why? Well, this is shit. But I mean, the barrel was cool and you got to break out of it. Um, it was just essentially like plates of, um, of Velcro and you just got to bust out of it. And that was sort of fun. So what's coming up uh, for Mr. Lambert? Um, I think um, a lot more getting back on stage and doing uh, doing comedy uh, for the main. I've uh, um, thinking about serious about writing a um, another hour uh, special, which I haven't done in a number of years. So look out for um, the New Zealand Comedy Festival. Not not the com- one coming up, but next year. Um, I'll be working at um, a number of the comedy clubs around town. There's three that happen every week um, and one that happens once a month. I'll be working out a whole bunch of new material um, and working through that. Hopefully the... um, Hopefully the... uh, uh, Middle Earth Lord of the Rings thing comes through. That'd be really nice. Um, You can hear my voice on... TV and radio at the moment. I am the voice of. <laughs> I'm the voice of Maltine. Maltine, New Zealand's leading five and one clostridial vaccine. So, um, if, you, if you're watching the All Blacks or anything to do with like with the country, if you're watching Country Calendar or whatever, and the um, Maltine ad comes on, it's a vaccine for cattle, yeah. Oh, and and. Uh, cattle and, and lambs um if that comes on that's my voice so that's a interesting gig i've been doing quite a bit of voiceover work lately and it's yeah it's good it's fun uh with that in mind uh, i think i've had enough of listening to your voice for now yeah, fair enough uh, let alone being on the radio and tv uh so before we conclude is there anything that you'd like to add no i think i'm good um you can uh check out my uh, Instagram um, at Betty Kent, um, which is fun. Um, Lambert's Luscious, www.lbo.co.nz uh, is, is uh, the website if you're looking for some premium uh, products. And just yeah, keep a, an eye on it if you're around Wellington um, for local comedy. We don't get along. We talk a lot a big game about um get along and supporting the arts in wellington but unfortunately local comedy sort of languishes and we don't really get the audiences so if you like to laugh there's some really funny people in wellington get along and uh and support those yeah so um if you've enjoyed this and if you like what axel's doing uh share like subscribe um comment all over this shit and remember if you want to hear us ramble on again Hashtag second interview with Ken. Now, if you want to see me take season three on the road, potentially in Auckland, where I have some awesome contacts, then jump over to our Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash entertaining interviews. And around that page, you will see a link on how you can support this channel to better make that happen. Hopefully you enjoyed entertaining interview season two. We had a whole ball of fun filming it. Uh, Once again, huge shout out to Tony McDonald from Plastic Groove for the venue and also for the audio engineering, one of our major sponsors, and our other major sponsor, Tim Simpson from Nitro Film, for sponsoring us with gear. So, like I said, jump over to our Facebook page, check it out, jump in and help us out, take Season 3 on the road, and hopefully we'll be seeing you guys again very soon.